to both like me now. Sorry, I forgot to hit record, so I'm doing that now. <laughs> sure. Um, so uh, Pope Leahy House um, was was the first one I ever ran into. And then uh, being up in Wisconsin, I ran into a couple more places. I lived uh, near the Annunciation uh, Greek Orthodox, which just was right down the road. But uh, I think it was really when I got involved in graduate school that I got to visit the um, B. Hardly Bradley House. And I wanted to get involved. And um, you know, they had just right open to the public. So that was the first opportunity I got to dig my hands in and get involved. You know, um, Michael, it's it's interesting. We we when we when I've talked to each of you ahead of time, um, there is this recurring theme of of early connection to Frank Lloyd Wright, and then some time before. So, Michael, what was your earliest connection to Frank Lloyd Wright, or or even things that were righty in? You know, that you would understand that that was a thing. Well, my uh, my my first connection was my folks owned a home in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, which is right on Lake Michigan. And uh, the home was built in 1950 and it wasn't done by Wright, it wasn't done by an apprentice, but it was done by someone who obviously uh, knew and was able to articulate the, some of the organic principles. Well, uh, I was pretty young back then and everyone said, well, you live in that Wright house. And I'm like, well, who is this guy? So I went to the library and at that time there were actually two books on Mr. Wright in the library. And I uh, did some research and I found out that indeed it was, was not done by Wright, but uh, someone who appreciated the principles. And that started over like a 45 plus year obsession. You know, um, speaking of sort of, you know, finding books and learning, Catherine, I think your connection to Wright started relatively early too. I think it in school or something? What was your connection to Frank Lloyd Wright? Especially since you're a native Oregonian, there's not a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright in Oregon. So how did you make the connection? Well, unlike Brock, I'm so jealous, Brock, that you had early exposure to the actual spaces. Um, and unlike that, um, I, my first exposure was through books and magazines and um, probably in, in high school. And I had an affinity toward what I was seeing in, in, in the books and magazines that was designed by Wright. Um, and, and then uh, along in graduate school, um, I had to do uh, for a class, uh, an educational biography. And um, because I had always had this fascination with Wright, I decided to do that. And that was when I first delved into to, uh, his, his architectural philosophy. And, um, and then, Many years went by um, and I uh, taught elementary school and public schools and I raised a family and then I, all my kids were out of the nest and I decided to spread my wings too and take advantage of an opportunity to train as a docent for this, new, this Frank Lloyd Wright house that had been newly moved to save it from demolition. And, um, and so the, the Gordon House was actually the first right space I actually had been in. And um, it's been a love affair ever since. Um, I've been to now 159 sites inside of them, thanks to many organizations that have wonderful tours. Um, and I find something new in each one. And, and so it's been a wonderful journey since 2002. And I'm happy to say my husband, um, has, has enjoyed the journey too, and has become quite um, an enthusiastic um, follower of Wright as well. That's such a long way to go from, you know, just first only being able to see books and magazines for so long. Price, when we talked, you talked about growing up on the other side of the country, Vermont, but mm, first, correct. first seeing Wright work, I think in some old House Beautiful magazines. In some old House Beautiful magazines, and I became fascinated by it by him and that formed my whole career. And I decided to become an architect and designer at a very early age. And I have to say that was basically formulated by my love of Frank Lloyd Wright and his use of architecture. And I loved building blocks and I had Frobel blocks when I was little, which of course Mr. Wright loved and feels in his hands every time he went to design a building. And then my life took on a very strange right direction. 
I went to college at Drex University in Philadelphia to study architecture and design. And my first teacher was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright and taught us how to draft in the way of Frank Lloyd Wright. And we went to all the Wright buildings with him around Philadelphia. And I began traveling to all of these myself. And to tell you just a freaky little story, I was designing a home in Westport, Connecticut for a client. I walked into their foyer. They had two tables and four stools from the Price Tower. Her husband had been a vice president <laughs> and they had taken, the furniture was given away when they sold the building. And then we commissioned Dale Jahuli to do a chandelier and we did all that. And the funny part was at the end of the job, she said to me, Price, one day you have to go see the Price Tower in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. And my answer was, why in God's name would I ever go to Oklahoma? And oddly enough, two years later, my partner was transferred to Bartlesville, Oklahoma. And I'm now living here and I love the town. I love Mr. Wright's buildings. And we have tremendous architecture here in Bartlesville. You absolutely so it was a very could. kind of odd route to follow. It, it is surprising to me the number of us who grow up in places so removed from right things and then somehow end up like, you know, uh, with uh, Catherine not even knowing, I think we talked about, you didn't even know there was a Frank Lloyd Wright building in Oregon until it became public and moved. Nathan is similar, grows up in Iowa. Nathan, what, what, how did you connect to Frank Lloyd Wright? Uh, so my first connection with Frank Lloyd Wright uh, was not Cedar Rock, but it's actually another uh, Frank Lloyd Wright house, uh, the Jackie Douglas Grant house in Cedar Rapids. Uh, I was born and raised in Cedar Rapids. I've lived there in my entire life. And when I was in high school, um, I was interested in the arts and architecture. And I was wondering, you know, what's out there around me? And uh, after some uh, research on uh, the internet, I had come across uh, the, the Jackie Douglas Grant House. I was able to find their address and I wrote him a simple letter. Uh, hey, you know, may I come see your home sometime? Uh, I'm interested in being an, uh, an architect someday. And so I got a letter back from him about two weeks later. And to kind of summarize it, he said, well, sure, stop on by, you know, anytime, which is convenient for you. And so I go over to um, meet him and they, they have a, a second house uh, set up right, right next door to the, the Frank the Great house. And so I had knocked on the, the front door there and I heard someone get up, but it took uh, a few minutes to get to the door. And here comes uh, Mr. David Grant uh, to the front door oh. with a boot, uh, or, or boot right on his foot. <laughs> and I asked him, well, uh, this doesn't really seem like a convenient time for you to visit. You know, I can stop by some other time. And he was so enthusiastic to show me the entire property. He, he took me on the grand, grand tour inside and outside the house. And I remember walking down the, the very long uh, stone staircase into the, the main living space that has two-story tall glass in it. And just that soaring feeling that you get when you walk into a, a lot of right structures that I've, I've noticed uh, since then uh, just uh, grasped me from there. And uh, that was my, my first interaction uh, with the Frank Lloyd Wright building. Um, I was even lucky enough that uh, Mr. Grant had let me uh, write my name on the dust in the countertop in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's it's fun to me to to hear us, you know, re reminiscing about sort of our firsts, right? You know, especially when when we think about uh, how many also, like you know, Catherine describes once this becomes something you're interested in, it kind of it becomes what some people might call an obsession. You know, we go to a lot of places. I mean. Brock's collecting name badges from those places because he's working there. But but we're all, you know, we all started to go out and about. You know, the other thing is, is that I, I would love to talk to you about, this is not a question I spoke to you all too much about, but for many times when we have a tour come through, we're a lot of people's firsts. You know, that same feeling you had, Nathan, going to see the Grant House or that uh, Catherine had uh, at Gordon House. You get to be the first 
Now, Brock, how many people make Taliesin in there first? And is that a is that a common thing? And so, how do you how do you train your interpreters and docents to sort of manage people who've never been anywhere before, and this is their experience with first experience with right? Well, you know, I always say that if I, I tell people if Taliesin is your first year in for quite an experience because. Um, you know, we, we have people who come through and some people, their first right house is the estate tour because they want to see everything, which is a four hour tour. And uh, it, it's typically not for, you know, the faint of heart, but, um, you know, we, we really have realized that we want to try to get people on a, a, a new ground level and things like that. So um, this year we just started our one hour tour to try to engage those folks who really want to just get a taste of Frank Lloyd Wright. Maybe they don't know what's what it's all about. And so giving this them a new opportunity to reach people in kind of a short period of time is a really exciting way to do that. And so our, our guides and our interpreters really work hard to make every experience very um, fresh, very personal, and, and very experiential. Um, something that people really get to feel part of the site before they even get to hear the information. You know, we were just talking sort of about, um, you know, Catherine talked about starting training, you know, uh, Price himself is training docents uh, now and bringing people on, Brock, the same thing. Michael, when you started at Taliesin West in in uh, Arizona, you were kind of early on, right? You started pretty early on and you had some interesting people training you to be a docent. Oh, absolutely. We had, and actually, I was in the first group of volunteers. And so there was about a... I think an eight week training session that we went to went, went through and that culminated with us really starting to develop our tour and what we were going to say, but we had some great help because I got to take tours with people like Cornelia Brierly, David Dodge, John Rattenberry. Uh, it, it was, it was tremendous. And you, you, when you do that, you get their individual take. Uh, on where they lived and where they worked. And so honestly, I, I mean, I never really developed anything unique or original. My tour was nothing more than crib notes I made from and took from what those individual people told me. You know, uh, Catherine, you have an education background because you were, you spent your career uh, as an educator so how much does that help you when you are giving your tours with people and having learned from the very beginning of the opening of Gordon House? Well, my, my education background has really influenced um, my tours tremendously. Um, I, I kind of treat our, our uh, tour guests as my classroom. And, um, and so I try to get to know them first um, what their experience is with the right. And, you know, when we first opened the Gordon House, almost everyone coming was, was that was their first experience with right. Um, now that we're a little more known, we have, we have visitors coming from all over the world who have visited right sites extensively. And so I often get a, a huge mix of people. Um, even with a small tour group, I can have first timers and I can have people who've been to many, many sites, um, including over to Japan. And so um, that's one of the joys and challenges of being a docent is to try to understand the, the different perspectives uh, through which they're seeing the house and different experiences and, and trying to make it relevant to each and every one of them. Um, and, and, and then, of course, there's always the challenge of when there's a little person that comes along with, with the adults, too, and keeping them engaged, which I find to be fairly easy in this house because there are things that really fascinate children, and we can always um, engage them in activities as we, as we go along um, that help them connect with different elements of the architecture. So I think my education background has, has been a huge asset. And, um, and then I've also taken over the role of, of helping develop the education, the K-12 program for the house over the years. And, um, and, and so I think that's been a, of, of help to the house too. Yeah, and I, I wanna get back into that part of it in a little bit about the, uh, about the 
ways that right sites interact with the school system and 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 young people because that is such an important thing for us to do to continue the legacy in that education prospect uh, price you've developed an entire tour program not only for price tower but also for the community center and the spaces in between so would you tell me a little bit about what you're doing at price tower right now and, and the way you've integrated several generations of right yeah. philosophy well, this is something that we just began last year. And we're very fortunate, in fact, that we have the Price Tower in 1956. We have the Bartlesville Community Center by William Wesley Peters, 1982, design began 1979. And we also have the new plaza that we just did, which is a sculpture garden. And in the fall of 2018, we had the current students at School of Architecture at Taliesin come in and do three proposals that were combined by a local architect. So standing in one position, we have three generations showing. And what's really neat about that, Tim, can you pull up the picture of the sundial? I will, it may take me just a moment, but I will be glad to. Well, one of the unique things is in the corner of the property is a sundial that was given by the Price family in memory of Mr. Wright. Is this ah, it? There we go, that's Good. it. And you can see the sundial there on the right and the plaque on the bottom reads to Frank Lloyd Wright, whose works are for all time and ages. And remember, you can just see the corner of the Price Tower on the left, the Community Center, 1979, and then this wonderful plaza that was just open last year. So we have three generations of design showing here, which really does show how timeless the whole design of Mr. Wright is and how it does translate through many generations of people. Now, the other thing that we're developing is we have another architect that was associated with Mr. Wright, Bruce Goff, who's becoming more and more popular. And one of my projects has been restoring the office that he used in the Price Tower and lived there for eight years. So we're also introducing a Bruce Goff tour that will be coming up. So we really offer so much. And, you know, I would like the other docents to chime in, but I think it's very unusual to be in a place where you can show three generations all at one time. A sculpture garden, a, a skyscraper, and we have a very small community. We're only 35,000, but we're culturally very rich. The community center seats 1,703 people and 500 in the General Assembly Hall. But today we have our own symphony orchestra, our own civic ballet company, children's music theater. So what's fascinating to me is how this whole Frank Lloyd Wright complex is used every day by everyone. And it's really the vital center of our arts district and of the community. And I couldn't be happier being here and able to share that with people. You know, um, I, I love when each, site is doing their own special things, taking advantage of what they have. I have not yet gotten to this event, but I am going to one day, Nathan. I think your first time at Cedar Rock, the house where you're in now, was for something called the Strawberry Moon, Eve, I, what is it called? Uh, the Strawberry Moon Evening Event. Uh, it is a, a one-time year event uh, that is usually in mid-June. And it's a chance to showcase uh, the park at night. Uh, we have lots of lights going. We have our Frank Lloyd Wright Design Council fire going. Uh, we have music. Uh, we're using our Steinway Grand Piano right behind me, uh, just emanating from the garden room and really spreading throughout the entire park. Um, and we, we, it really draws in uh, a lot of people, whether you're uh, interested in the arts or whether you're interested in nature or, you know, anywhere in between. Uh, we have people that just stop in, you know, that see our sign along Highway 20 and uh, that they'll stop by and check us out. <laughs> um, but Strawberry Moon, it was uh, the first time I had experienced Cedar Rock and it added a whole nother dimension to Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, being able to experience uh, a Frank Lloyd Wright house uh, at night and to really 
uh, enjoy it at your own pace. Um, and I, I don't know that I want to put you on the spot because I don't know how good the uh, sound quality through Zoom is, but I would like everyone else to know that among Nathan's many skills is that he plays that Steinway piano back there for guests when they're in the house on occasion, if you ask him nicely. And it does change <laughs> the feeling of the garden room. I, I, it's so lovely. It is just marvelous. So uh, Nathan, thank you for, I mean, I'm not going to make you go over there and play it, but if that happens, it happens. Uh, I don't know how good the sound would be through Zoom. So get yourself there to do it. Brock, you were showing us actually something. Let's let's just let's just inflate Nathan's head a little more. Did you guys put out stickers or something, Nathan? I think Brock was showing one earlier before we started. Yep this this is this is a sticker that I got we got from Nathan, and I went Nathan. You maybe you could tell us a little bit about these. Yes. Um, so the, the stickers just came out about a, a week or two ago, and we were looking for uh, something that people, a little something that people could take with them uh, that really resembled uh, a, a little snippet of cedar rock. And with the sticker, you may notice that there's a part of the cedar rock limestone bluff and a part of our Frank Wright design boathouse, which is uh, one of the, the very few Frank Wright boathouses to still exist. Um, and it's really the connection between uh, the man-made and the natural world around us that I think the, the sticker captures so beautifully. And you can put it ever, anywhere you want to, whether it's on the back of a computer, <laughs> uh, your, a favorite mug, um, anywhere you'd like it to go. I, you know, uh, one of the things that, that is Im important, especially because I know, I know we're, we're, we can look into the houses, that, the two of you that are at the sites and right inside the rooms, you know, we see all of this uh, right stuff that's there. Obviously, Taliesin and Taliesin West, you know, where Wright lived, have huge collections of things. Michael, you were telling us earlier, I think maybe before, well, even I think you said in your intro that you've moved from interpreting now into the collections department, partly because your knees have decided to make it difficult to walk around all the property as much as you need to. Tell us what your collections uh, does and what your job is there. And is there really that much stuff that you have to keep track of? Oh my gosh, the, uh, the collections uh, department, the collections group, we, we have over a thousand different objects, photographs, ceramics, textiles, Asian art, Native American art, uh, correspondence and biographical information uh, from uh, all of the past fellowship members. Uh, it's, it's quite huge and uh, it's all in the process of being preserved and, and cataloged really for future research and, and uh, future uh, generations. And that's part of, part of what I'm doing just as a, on, a, on a volunteer basis is helping to catalog some of that, some of that information. And uh, Mike, Michael, I know um, maybe not everyone will know this, although a lot of the the real serious right aficionados will know that uh, the archives of Franklin Wright archives themselves have gone to uh, the MoMA and to the Avery, but you're talking about the collection yes. of items that are left at the home as his personal items, the things yeah, that are, the, right, that are the, yeah, for lack of a better word, correct. decorating Tally S and West. Yeah, but primarily what we do, what we deal with uh, uh, is really the, the materials clothing, et cetera, that Mr. Wright and Mrs. Wright left, or that are items that are really pertinent to primarily Talius and West. Um, so that's our little segment of the world. And, and there, there's a lot of, there's a lot there. Yeah, there's a lot to do, obviously. Uh, and Brock shaking his head, because probably he'd have a similar story there at Talius and in Wisconsin. I want to get to something else though, Brock, because, uh, I think we could probably talk for hours and hours, but I did tell people this was 90 minutes. So we'll just, we're going to, we'll be, we'll be ending by, uh, we'll be ending by 8.30 my time on the East Coast. Um, what's fun is Nathan talked about, you know, knocking on a door, taking a little while for the person to get there. Maybe I'm, it, you had a story that I don't know the whole story because we just talked by email about waking up Dr. John Christian. So uh, that's, I don't know if it's connected, but it sounded like it might go here. So I'm going to segue you into that answering, uh, telling us about it. 
when, when Nathan said that, uh, that's exactly what I flashed to because um, I had uh, I had moved back to Indiana. I'm from Indiana originally, and I had moved back to Indiana um, and decided to drive an hour and a half to go to West Lafayette near Purdue's campus uh, to visit uh, the John um, Christian House, uh, Samara. And it was my first time ever there. So um, it was, we were meeting in the morning and I was trying to be set a good impression. So I th figured, oh, I'll get there early. So I get there early and I don't see the other vehicle. That, or I see a vehicle in the parking lot, but I was like, oh, maybe, maybe they're here. So maybe I should just knock on the door. Of course, not knowing the history of the house, um, I knocked on the door and John Christian still lived there. Um, he was in his 90s at that time. So I knocked on the door for a little bit. I could hear somebody inside. Uh, he walks up to the door with his walker uh, in his nightgown and nightcap. And I was so literally embarrassed that I had woken up this uh, uh, just lovely, sweet man, but uh, fairly elderly by that point. Um, and he, he was very cordial, very courteous, but I was so deeply embarrassed and so deeply uh, uh, felt so bad for opening, for waking him up early. So uh, yeah, impromptu visits. I think we all have some of those uh, stories where we, you know, we, we're eager, but you know, uh, that, that happens everywhere, doesn't it? You know, get people who are so excited to be there, uh, so excited to be. In fact, uh, <laughs> I'm just bouncing around between different people. I love to talk about who some of your interesting tour guests have been. And I never ask you to tell me an embarrassing thing about anyone. So you don't have to tell me anything negative or bad. Price, you were telling me about somebody who literally Price Tower was a bucket list for this lady. Yeah. And, and I, I, I tell you that because I just took a group to Falling Water over the weekend. And for a lot of people in the U.S., Falling Water is our bucket list. How does Price Tower become someone's bucket list? Well, it was very strange. This woman was from Australia and she had retired. So you can tell her age. And in eighth grade, she had put this on her bucket list. That was her book report on the Price Tower in Bartlesville, Oklahoma <laughs> that she chose to do. And as she told me, it wasn't easy. There were no computers back then. And that had been on her bucket list since she was in eighth grade in Australia. And oddly enough, we have many people who have very early memories of the Price Tower. And, you know, because Oklahoma is a bit out of the way, we're also on a lot of people's bucket list to be the last state they visited in the country. And we have, I can't tell you how many people who are turning 50 want to say they've seen all 50 states. And because we are also a hotel and restaurant complex, we have wonderful people celebrating things. And that's the best part of it all. Pr Price, that, that, that brings up a great question because, you know, um, there, are, there are a few other tall right buildings, but the description of Skyscraper from Wright himself becomes important because of his, de his description of what a skyscraper was. What was Wright's definition and how does Price Tower fit that? His definition was it has, a skyscraper had to have commercial, residential, and retail and be a multi-use building. Well, when the building opened, the HC Price Company had constructed it. They occupied the 11th through the 19th floor. We had eight residential apartments and we had a commissary that served food. We also had Barbara's dress shop for retail. So the really fun part of it is 65 years later, we opened on February 10th, 1956. We are still living Mr. Wright's dream. We have 19 hotel rooms for residential. We have, I'm stretching it, a gift shop for retail. We have four floors of commercial office space. And what was the commissary when Mr. Price served free lunch every day is now the kitchen for our Copper Barn restaurant. So we are totally living his dream 65 years later. Mm. And I regret it every day when the housekeepers fight our tour groups for elevators to clean the hotel. 
and the restaurant people are coming, the hotel guests are coming, and the lunches are coming. So it's quite unique. We are not the quiet little museum that the rest of you are experiencing. We are living, breathing buildings. <laughs> you know, with people coming and going all the time. UPS men delivering, FedEx men. It's quite often the madhouse where I get interrupted and people think since I'm talking, even though I'm in the middle of a tour, that I should be able to check them into the hotel. <laughs> so I don't think that happens any other Why not? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. That's because they don't trust me with a hotel computer, so I can't do it. <laughs> it's probably a good it's probably a good thing. <laughs> it's probably a good thing. Um I am bouncing around. I may get to some of you again before I get to the others. I, I'm not keeping a, a list of who I talked to last, so I hope you have, will will uh, give me a little bit of leeway in that regard. I, I I one of the things I really like to ask docents because it's so important to me. As as Price doesn't get as much quiet time clearly as the rest of you would, but but there are certainly times where you get to be the only one in a space, or you sort of get some time to yourself. Um, uh, I, I had a great opportunity. I visited Brock at, at uh, his office uh, that was, or maybe still is, uh, you know, right there at the house. And, uh, and you get the time to sort of see the place without all the people sometimes. Price, maybe you have to go in the middle of the night. But, but I want right. to talk about your, your favorite spots. And, uh, and you really, Catherine, you've described them as spaces. I really love that description of Wright's work because he's very much about space and i hope you can hear me catherine because your your video is frozen for me but hopefully you'll be back with us um catherine do you have a favorite space there at gordon house yeah it's connection is unstable well we, here's what we'll do catherine i'll give you just a minute we'll come back to you in a moment okay hopefully the the internet will change a little bit nathan do you have a favorite place there at at cedar rock Okay, no. I do. I have quite a few, but um, well, one of them being the piano space behind me. But another one is uh, the terrace of the boathouse. If I have a morning that I can get here uh, early enough, and I'll, I'll come down to the house, and I'll go down to the boathouse, and I'll practice uh, some morning yoga there. Um, I was able to do that uh, just this last week. And it has uh, a really powerful effect on you when you're when you can be there by yourself and to really take in everything around you. Um, so <laughs> that is a picture of uh, my yoga mat and my backpack down there with me. And, um, the morning that uh, really stuck with me um, when I was down there, it was kind of a hazy morning. Uh, there was some fog still floating floating on. Uh, above the Wapsie Pinnacan River. It was kind of an overcast day. And because of the, the wildfires in uh, Canada uh, at the time, uh, the sky had a really uh, kind of hazy, almost golden hue to it. And it was a, a cool morning. And I just remember, uh, oh, what was uh, the movement? It, it had something to do um with um uh, a warrior pose and i was just turning around with my eyes closed and for whatever reason i thought to myself right this way and as i'm doing my arms like this um i opened my eyes and no more than six feet away from me was a, a great blue heron that was soaring right in front of the boathouse and landed right on the wapsie pinnacan river and that was like right there i had my my nature epiphany right there <laughs> i was so connected to the world around me and it was such a, a beautiful tranquil setting to really experience mm -hmm. mm, how good thank you so much that's I think those are the kind of things when we when we get to experience a right space. And Catherine, you were talking about, you know, you, you describe them as spaces. And I think that's more accurate. We talk about right houses, but really we're experiencing space as molded by the master. So at, at Gordon House, what's the space that really gets you going or make or calms you down or gives you the most feeling? Well, I think for our guests, um, 
the drama comes fairly soon after they enter the house because it, it, as Wright does, he compresses you as you walk in um, in a very short, short and dark space. And then um, the, the great room in which I'm sitting right now just explodes with light and height. And so that's pretty much the wow moment uh, for our guests. Um, but you mentioned quiet times in the house and um, my two favorite places when we don't have guests um, are sitting in the banquette. I don't, would it be okay if I turned my screen and showed people I mean, here? Yeah, we'd love a tour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd love a tour. Okay. Sure. Uh-oh, I just lost you. Oh, well, you might see us in a moment. You can go ahead and turn and just oh, keep talking. There, there we go. go. There we go. Can you, can, I can't see it, but can you see the banquette? Yes. 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 Okay. So, so it's very sheltered. This is on the north. I'm not house yeah. and um and there's and light in and go ahead yeah, turn back in the, your... in the corner of the banquet yeah put it back there so that way we're getting on the same internet access there you go you're just going in and out a little bit and we know sometimes that happens at right sites uh you don't always the internet doesn't always fit to you so well so you might take a moment to come back yeah we do yeah this... okay you're better now. Come look at, okay, are you seeing me? Because I'm not seeing you. We are seeing you. So just go, you can go ahead and keep describing because okay. we can hear you. Okay, so it, there's a little corner there and I love to sit there um, and read. Um, you're very sheltered. The ones in around your shoulders. And um, and and diagonally out the uh, the uh, west and east sides, where we have banks of uh, double doors that are uh, floor to ceiling, and they all open out. And and so you, you just it's just this wonderful sheltered space, but a connection with the beautiful landscape around us and the beautiful columns that define a space um, in the great room. And then my second favorite uh, space is upstairs. I won't <laughs> take my computer up there, but um, in the east bedroom upstairs, um, there's a, one of Mr. Wright's disappearing corners. It's um, a, a door that comes together at a 90 degree angle and opens up. So the space just flows in and out, but you can lie on the bed and um, what you see, <laughs> from the bed, a strong horizontal band of light coming in the north side of the bedroom. It's just gorgeous. And I'm trying to see if I can put up a picture of that, that may be here on the second floor because these windows can open. I could be wrong. I'm just trying to share a couple of pictures. Uh, I would like to share a main picture of the Gordon house because I some of us may not be familiar with it since it is sort of, uh, it, it's so removed from a lot of us. It's uh, way up there in Oregon. This is pretty unique, Catherine, because it's a two-story Usonian, and there aren't many of those. Is that right? I think we're just having some internet issues in and out. So we'll come back to you in a minute, Catherine. No worries. And um, now, Michael and Brock, you both... You um, both are... <laughs> Catherine, we'll come back to you in a moment, okay? M Michael and Brock, you're both at pretty wide, expansive... Uh, facilities are a little bit bigger than um, than either Cedar Rock or Gordon House. Michael, do you have a favorite spot at Taliesin West? And I love the fact that maybe it's not necessarily inside, right? My favorite spot is not a spot. My favorite place is and always has been since the first time I went there for a tour in 1971 was the drive from Shea Boulevard all the way up to Taliesin and West. Now, that approach has changed a lot over the years, but it has never been a straight shot. It's always a curve, several curves, um, just, like, uh, just like walking down to, uh, to Falling Water, you make a couple of turns and then all of a sudden the entire building is revealed to you. And that's the way it is at Talius and West. And that drive alone could 
lower my blood pressure by 20 points. So you that's a, a good thing. You shared a great picture of uh, the sign here, Taliesin Road sign. Yes. Uh, uh, actually, the first time I went to visit Taliesin West Shea Boulevard was a two lane to blacktop road. And the approach to Taliesin West was marked uh, with a sign. It wasn't this sign. This is actually a photograph of the sign that was there, I believe in the mid 1950s. And I believe that photograph was taken by Robert May. I could be, I could be mistaken, but that's my understanding. Now, now Brock, we're, you're here today as a representative, uh, a representative of Taliesin Preservation, but you've obviously been an a docent or a guide or an interpreter at several other sites. So you can pick any of those you wanna talk about. Do you, do you have a favorite uh, sort of spot that you like to go? So, I mean, each, each space is a little bit different. I've worked in a prairie, a Usonian, a, you know, falling water in Taliesin, which are completely different uh, beasts altogether. Um, I, you know, I, I always tell people my favorite places are where there's just a peace and quiet where you're surrounded by the buildings, but you are immersed in nature. And so actually the picture I sent you of the outdoor space um, is very pertinent because it is it is one of my favorite spaces on the estate. Um, it's right outside of Frank Lloyd Wright's bedroom on the terrace that, sit, that joins his bedroom. And there's something so beautiful about this space. It's um, It's got views of the Welsh Hills right across the road. Um, you can see Unity Chapel right across the way, and you can see Tanaderry right away, uh, the home of Jane Porter, Frank Lloyd Wright's sister. So this is one of my favorite spaces because I feel like when you go there, you can really see all the history of Taliesin kind of coming together in one spot. And this, hap this happened to be when I was um, actually staying on site during the winter time when I first moved up here. And um, it's still one of my favorite views because you have the trees kind of giving it some shelter you have the house giving it shelter with the eaves and you just feel surrounded even though you're in a space where you're outdoors and you're um getting these beautiful vistas so it's it's a very special place to me i um i i, I have i mean i could probably find a spot everywhere uh among where you are price i think yours is actually a little more interesting trying to find a particular one single space it's there's so many dynamic spaces at price tower is there one place you feel more at home or or is more exciting or relaxing for you well do you know if you could show a picture tim one of the ones yeah. i sent of uh, the mural yes you know it's very interesting because the tower has many different aspects playing into it you walk into a very tall lobby like he did in his early homes and then to smaller spaces that reverses upstairs. But we have this incredible cloisonne mural that was designed by John Krakowin Hill. You walk into this very high space and the lights above the stars in the heavens as Mr. Wright said. Then you go through a low doorway into this lower space with this incredible glowing mural. And there's nothing more exciting than to come in in the morning and have turn on the lights and have this wonderful glowing mural looking back at you. The name of the mural is Willows in Reflection. So whenever I look at it, and then I look down at the top of the Taliesin design cocktail table, and I see the reflection of the willows, you get that wonderful feel of water, of peace, of green growing. And the method of construction is close a day and Polly Lamb did it. And can you see that masterful mixing of color that makes it look like water? So whenever I walk in in the morning, I feel transported to a different place. And I see this wonderful mural just glowing and it looks different on a cloudy day, a sunny day, a snowy day. So there's always something new and interesting to look at when I come in in the morning. And then my second favorite place is Mr. Price's office up on the top floor. 
which I go to when I'm tired of everyone and I have to get away. And it's this wonderful office with a wonderful mural by Eugene Matholik. And one very special place is the terrace of his office. And when you go out there, you just feel like you're floating above the city. You have the wonderful background of the tower and you really feel like you're part of the tower out of that terrace. And that has to be my second favorite place to be. But as Tim said, it's very hard to determine your favorites because the tower has more different spaces than almost any other building. We have offices. We taper up the top like a tree. We have terraces. We have offices. We have residential, et cetera. So it's really a multi a multifaceted passenger experience as you go through the building. I will tell you my least favorite space at Price Tower are the elevators built for one person, or maybe not. <laughs> Those elevators, Price, I'm, I'm, I don't like small, tight spaces. Wow, talk about compression. Yeah. Uh, those well, are pan yeah. panic inducing. Panic inducing. Yes. They're only 10 square feet. And when I read the writings of Mr. Wright, he designed them to be like part of a honeycomb. And he, because that was nature's best storage capsule. And I hate to tell you, you are but storage going up and down. <laughs> but yeah, I want to tell you, you were kind of weak. I had a group of senior citizens. I had this little lady from Texas, 79 years old, and she said, I'm not getting on the elevator. And I said, well, we're going up to 19 right now. And she said, fine, I'll meet you up there. And she walked up 19 floors and down 19 floors. But that is one of the biggest problems we have in the building. I have people say, I won't get in that elevator, which is, of course, the most exciting, going to the most exciting part of the building. And the other thing that I find strange is when we go to go up, people say, I never knew that I would have to go on a high floor. I don't like heights. And, you know, I finally said to one woman, did you see the name of the building, the Price Tower? Tower. Tower usually means a tall building, so it does mean you have to go up. In, in all fairness, Price, I thought I would I thought I would be very comfortable going up there, and I got to one of the higher floors, and my vertigo kicked in like nothing else. So, so you well, know, do it a thousand times a day, and you won't get that. <laughs> well, you've clearly become accustomed to Wright's unit system. You know, definitely in his uh, later work, that's he used that everywhere. And I think it'll be interesting to contrast the unit systems at Gordon House and Cedar Rock. So Nathan, Cedar Rock's a little different. I've been, in, I have been, I was at the Rosenbaum House in, um, in Florence, Alabama, and the unit system is a two by four rectangle. And so since Wright doesn't want to put in four foot wide doors, he puts in two foot wide doors. So I have pictures of me squished in the door. Yeah. What's, what's the unit system look like at, at uh, Cedar Rock and how does that change sort of the, the feel of the house? So the unit system at Cedar Rock is really a, a unique one. Uh, most Usonian houses are designed with two foot, four foot uh, systems, but ours is a five foot three grid system here much larger than most other frankly great grid systems. And it really changes uh, the, the whole feeling of the house. Um, and to really kind of bring in a construction point here, these windows behind me, they're also um, a part of the grid system too. They're five foot three wide. And as I understand, these were the largest panes of glass that you could order back in 1950 and have delivered all the way out here in rural Iowa to the site. And I think that really says something uh, about this house in particular, because this house uh, is well, really immersed in the middle of Iowa. And for frankly, right, to install the biggest windows here, uh, I think Wright really wanted to bring in as much as the outside as he could here. It really helps that it's the garden room. I mean, it's enormous, right? Isn't it something like 900 square feet or something? Yes, it makes up half, half of the total square footage of the house. And wow. speaking of square footage, uh, our house is only 1,800 square feet. 
if you were to count up all the glass panes around me here throughout the entire house, uh, that would equate to 1,600 square feet, just 200 square feet less than the total footprint that this house takes up. <laughs> And it really does. You get in, into that garden room and I, I mean, my blood pressure dropped significantly, uh, which is good because I had high blood pressure at the time. So it was actually a good thing for me medically. And, <laughs> and all of that greenery <laughs> growing and it just, you've, I, he takes such good advantage of the site there, doesn't he? Because you're separated from anyone. There's no one nearby. No one's going to look in your windows. So he gives these enormous, gigantic windows to look through. Now, Catherine, the grid, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going here without knowing what the grid is at the Gordon House, since you're one of the two sites in the public sites in the country I've never visited. Although Catherine's told me I have to correct that really soon. <laughs> so Catherine, what's the grid system like at Gordon and how does that make it special or different there? Well, we have a very different grid system. We have seven foot squares. Um, We've had um, former apprentices at Taliesin come in to Gordon House and say, whoa, I've, I've never been in one of his designs with seven foot squares. Um, I, at one point, went started going through William Storr's Frank Lloyd Wright Companion looking for seven foot square grids, and I found three. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't swear to that. I think it needs to be verified, but they're not many. But I think to put that in context, um, the Gordon House was really designed as a farmhouse. Um, the Gordons lived on um, a, a huge acreage of land on the south bank of the Willamette River, which is one of our major rivers in Oregon, um, with a view of Mount Hood and uh, vast fields in every direction. Um, and so the seven foot grid, as odd as it may sound, really kind of captures that expansive territory on which the house sat. And of course it extends outside to the patios and terraces. Um, and so I, I, I think the typical smaller four by fours or two by fours rectangle would have seemed um, really out of place in that particular setting. Um, why he chose a seven foot square, um, I, I, haven't, I haven't met anyone who can explain that to me. <laughs> uh, we're getting some great questions in the chat. So I'm gonna go through some of those. And one of them, uh, Price, it's gonna be for someone else, but I love it. It's one of your docents at Price Tower. Bill Harris has been a docent a little over a year and says, I'm still learning through my training, tours each week and self-study. How do some of these long-term docents keep that sense of intrigue? So Michael, I know you more recently stopped giving uh, tours where you walk around, but when you did that, even, even as you were in, in you know, decades into doing that, how did you keep that fresh and interested? How did you keep yourself interested so you weren't just repeating you know, a, a rote recitation or something? Well, the, the way I did it was uh, really uh, at the beginning of the tour, asking uh, people what their, what their knowledge level was. Had they been to other right sites? What were their interests? And of course, as you know, and everyone here will know that you get all, all sorts of people. Some it's a first time, some it's a second. And, and I mean, I, I basically gave the same tour all the time. What made it interesting for me was when people asked questions. And once they asked the questions, uh, then I was able to fall on my wealth of knowledge to answer that question and, and hopefully satisfy uh, everyone from first timers to, uh, you know, architects who understood almost all of them. So that's, that's how I kept my interest was really in the trying to learn as much as I could over the years so that I could be the, you know, when I was giving the tour, I was the resource. So that's how I kept fresh. So I, uh, this does bring up an interesting question because you, you will get questions, different people will know more than others. So Rock, I think you're dealing with this regularly um, and, and, I, and I know you'll have an answer that, that works well for this. Uh, so I'm kind of, I'm throwing this one on you, Brock. We, we most of us know that, um, that Price was earlier talking about the students from the School of Architecture at Taliesin, which has since moved to a different site after a change in the relationship between the foundation and 
the, um, the, the school. And I know you don't work for the foundation, you work for Talia's and Preservation. So, but in that way, you're giving tours and a lot of people know, oh, there was a school here or isn't there a school here? How do you address that without derailing the tour into conversations that can sometimes get political in the Franklin right world? And how do you explain, you know, the education focus that Wright had for so long and how that's continuing or not continuing or whatever? Well, I think last year was a very interesting year because um, really uh, aside from the school, you know, we also had this little thing called COVID. And so there are a lot of other world things um, that also took a lot of precedence. I think for us, um, we, we always explain, you know, it's kind of one of those things we work closely as partners with the foundation. Um, but at the same time, we, we say, you know, it's kind of like two friends not, you know, no longer having a relationship. And while you can still be friends with them, they, they just don't have a mutual friendship anymore. Um, for us, I think it's it's understanding that the world is changing and, and how the how the spaces get interpreted um, are very different. Um, I think it's so important to keep those stories of the apprentices of the fellowship alive in um, in our spaces. And and maybe I think it was sometimes hard when uh, when the fellows were here to be able to tell their stories. And I know I've, I've talked with Minerva a couple times um, who is one of our longest um, living fellows here um, about how we can we can tell those stories of those fellowship and still keep this as an educational space and still keep this as a growing space. Um, it's never gonna be perfect. I mean, people are still gonna have memories of of being there, of the students working there. And it is different, it's a different world. And um, at the same time, we're still looking to keep the inspiration alive, still looking to keep um, people engaged in those stories. And also the, um, the focus of what we learned from Prank Lloyd Wright and how it stays relevant today, I think is still ever present, so. Well, I appreciate that. And I know, I know that Talius and Preservation isn't always in the best situation there, but you guys do a great job of making sure you still tell the story. Um, I've, I've been on the four hour tour, probably, I don't know, 20 hours so far. <laughs> I think I've done it maybe four or five times because I just want to be in that space. You know, I just want to be there. And, uh, but we do know that COVID has made some big changes. So I do want to talk to each of you about that price specifically. When we talked, we really talked about, because you mentioned it earlier, you're giving so many tours yourself because COVID has, I, I don't mean this in a, a way that encompasses death, but it's really decimated your your it tour, has. yeah your 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 tour guides and other people because of the populations that typically are volunteer docents. Those who have the time to do that are typically a little older, and those are the people most affected by COVID and less likely to come out and do as many things. So, how is that affected, and how are you adjusting to the changes of COVID so you can still give tours? Well, I'm adjusting by doing a great deal of them myself. And we were the first, Frank, one of the first Frank Lord Wright sites to open. We opened in June of last year, June 1st. And no volunteers would come in because they were afraid. So I did 58 tours a month, seven days a week to keep our program going and active. And where I've been very lucky, I've had a few docents come back but I've also gotten some wonderful new ones like Bill Harris who just responded and two docents that have been docents at Talias and West for many years who are now living part-time in Bartlesville. So I've added four docents, but I'm actually running the program on only myself and five docents. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I'm, Which having, is not I'm even... having a panic attack thinking about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that gets you and a cookie. Do you know what? I've never canceled the tour because of something. We keep going. And believe it or not, last year, even with the time of COVID, I personally brought over 650 people through the building which is, I think, amazing. And it shows you how interested the Price Tower is to people and how much people want to see it. But I will say COVID has proved to be a huge challenge to me. And 
unlike a lot of you, you have larger spaces than I do to deal with. Mm -hmm. In the Price Tower, we have very minimal spaces. And I require a mask by everyone. And I'm sure some of you have had the experience of being told that I will not wear a mask under any condition. COVID is a lie. And those people told the tour has been canceled and your refund will be given. And it's been a very unique situation of dealing with people and finding out different views <laughs> to put on that mask. And, you know, uh, it's something that's very difficult. And I think the Price Tower is a particularly difficult place because we have no locations that you can actually social distance when you go upstairs. Yeah, it's very tight. It's very tight. You know, unlike uh, uh, unlike at like let's say Taliesin or Taliesin West, I mean, there it's built for a large group of people. I mean, you can kind of there are right. a few small spaces, right, Brock? Yeah, you you do. I mean. Go oh. ahead, go ahead, Michael. Okay, well, so uh, the the tour program really took, because they were shut down, I mean, for, for months and months and a long time because of COVID, but they took that opportunity to reimagine how do you handle groups of people in these situations? And one of the things that they came up with, uh, which I think has become kind of a mainstay, uh, a, a, a mainstay of the program is audio tour. So now you have the option to take an audio tour, which there is no interaction with a guide or a docent, or should you like, you can take a longer tour that is docent led. So, you know, we would find, and I found over the years that, you know, especially in the winter time, people tend to come here in the winter because of the weather. A lot of people were coming to Taliesin because it was either this or the zoo. <laughs> or or this or you know the botanical garden and many had no idea of who frank lloyd wright was and sometimes they would get you know they couldn't handle even an hour tour it was too much for them so i think the audio tour really uh, uh takes the weight off of that and gives people a good meaningful informative overview and then should people really need more information or want it they will know that they could take a docent led tour. That's how they dealt with it. That's pretty great, what actually. Um, Brock, what, but what have you changed there, Brock, uh, for, t for COVID with Taliesin? So last year when we started, we, we opened um, at the same time. We opened at, uh, at June instead of April, which, was a, which is a big jump. And um, very much like Price, our, our team was almost brand new because we had so many people who were concerned about health. And so I had to recruit a brand new team for, for our uh, tour program, um, which we, we managed to uh, get a great group of people who were um, a, a couple veterans, but a lot of really bright and inspired people to come in. Um, the biggest things, you know, you talked about Tim a little bit about some of the spaces having more room or, or less room. Once you go inside the spaces, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, compressing everything. And so you suddenly are very close quarters, even if you have large spaces to social distance in, you still have the transportation between those spaces. And um, so once we, we kind of create a path of a one direction kind of tour, everybody's going one way through the house. They're, they're only going, uh, you know, stopping in one spot. And when they were in larger rooms, we actually put spots on the floor for people to stand so they could remain socially distanced while they're in the spaces, which that was a, a great help The um, our members of the foundation who work here also helped us with some of those. Um, one, once we got past the period where we could, you know, um, at least outdoors, uh, not don masks this year, which was kind of a nice experience, especially for our estate tour, we, we, we've done a lot more to um, engage people, but I think you know, obviously right now with the Delta variant uptick, we, we've been very, very conscientious about bringing masks back. And I think we're continuing to watch things because as, as we say, uh, even though we are in Iowa County, um, you know, which is not the, one of the more populated areas, our guests are not. Our guests are coming from all over the United States. Um, but this has surprisingly been, compared to last year, a bounce back year. And uh, our numbers have been really pretty good this year. So. 
it's almost business as usual at this point. So, you know, the thing about that is, um, so I told you I was just at Falling Water this weekend uh, with uh, the company I co-own. So full disclosure, tonight's brought to you by a company I co-own, but um, I'll give you a refund of your money if you don't like it being commercial. Turns out it was free, so <laughs> there you go. Um, and uh, we had a group go, we did our Tally S and I'm sorry, Falling Water and More Tour, which is Falling Water, Kentuck Knob, Polymath Park, and really way too much food and fun and enjoyment in between. And uh, I have to tell you that tour sold out in 24 hours. We sold all 25 spots in 24 hours. Uh, everyone was willing to share with us that they were vaccinated and they were willing to bring proof of that in case anywhere in Pennsylvania required us to show proof. Um, we also did uh, have several people who decided to um, drive themselves rather than ride on our motor coach, even though we only put 25, we only were gonna use 25 seats out of 56 on the bus. So we still only, we only ended up having about 20 people on the bus and was able to spread out. And those people were very happy. They, no one gave them any issue for not riding the bus. We were all happy to be able to share the spaces together. The, the most important thing to me was, and I know this is probably very difficult for the numbers at Falling Water, at, because you know this Brock, having been there. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll share a nice picture of you. <laughs> uh, here we go. Here, here's, here's Brock, the education in 2017. <laughs> oh, um, and so, yeah, very nice tie, right? So uh, they only allowed six or seven people per tour. And here's the difference. For those of you who've been to Falling Water, typically you're putting a group of 25 to 30 people and all shoved into the living room together at Falling Water, that great big space, which can't be much different or even maybe bigger than the space there at Cedar Rock, Nathan. And you're in this amazing space, but there's so many people that you might as well be at a cocktail party where you really can't see the space. I got to walk in for the first time and I've been to Falling Water now, I think five times. For the first time, I was able to walk in there with only five other people and see that space in a way that I hadn't felt it before. And I, and I, I made sure I told the, the, the docent, I feel so bad to say this, but I'm really appreciative that the tour is so small. And I know it's hurting the numbers at Falling Water and it's hurting the numbers to have to limit that way. It was a wonderful experience. I don't know we'll get as much. Is there a value out there to having some smaller groups? And, and I know, you know, I know Nathan, probably you regularly have some pretty small groups that you take. Does it change when you have a group of 25 people or if you have a group of five, Nathan? And this is even a pre-COVID question if you want to answer it that way. Yes. Um, so it it really depends on the on the on the group size that we have here, and we it can fluctuate very widely. Uh, for instance, this morning we had thirty people show up for our ten a.m. tour, <laughs> and we weren't expecting that many people. Um, but we do often have uh, the opportunity to uh, give give you almost a more personalized tour, and uh, in in ways we're really able to give you a, a really enhanced experience about the house. Uh, our house being a Usonian home, it's designed uh, very efficiently in other spaces that it's not the main living space. And so um, uh, some ways we have adapted to COVID and other ways have uh, remained uh, similar. Um, but one of the ways that we changed uh, was we were able to enhance our tour with QR codes. And those uh, give an opportunity to show uh, historical photos of a spot where a QR code can be placed. And so it really adds that uh, extra dimen dimension of uh, time and how things uh, haven't changed and how things some have, uh, some, uh, have changed. Um, but really with a unique room like the garden room here at Cedar Rock and being able to have all the doors wide open, um, you, you can really uh, enjoy the house uh, being here in person while remaining uh, distanced. Um, and anywhere you are, um, it's a beautiful room to be in. Um, and I think one of those ways is, well, with the, the grand piano, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was quoted for saying, architecture is basically frozen music. So any chance I have uh, to be here and to really showcase our piano to people, it really helps uh, bring the site uh, as alive as it can be. And I can give a little demonstration uh, now if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, make your way over there and I'll, I'll, I'm going to cover something while you do that. Go right ahead. Mm -hmm. So Nathan's going to play music for us. I have to say, when I think about when I first met Nathan, I was like, I can't believe 
that there are is another generation willing to go here. And I think all of you will say, especially um, uh, Catherine, you you talk to a lot of young people and turn them onto architecture through here. So we're gonna we're, before we get into that, though, we'll listen to Nathan here. And I think is that Katie behind the, the is Katie behind the computer? <laughs> yep, Katie yeah. is is with. The, thank you, Katie. Good to see you. All right, Nathan, the floor yeah. is yours for a minute. Fantastic job. Thank you so, so much. Yes. Great job, Nathan. Good job. I'll nice tell you hand shot talk too. A little bit about the song itself. Uh, I call it Into the Crystal Garden. And just uh, the melody of the song is just inspired by the spelling of cedar. Uh, so on the keys of a piano, there's keys labeled from A to G. And I'm able to spell out cedar. C, E, E, A. And then R is for rest. <laughs> and then just give it a nice wide base, much like the wideness of the house. Lovely. Way, way above I, any of my skills. So amazing. Oh. <laughs> right, that's so good. That's so good. You know, uh, you are perfectly fit with that particular location, um, but I do like to I do like to ask people. You're at this right building. You're giving tours. You're eager. People asking, you know, how do you keep it exciting? Where do you really want to go, or where would you like to visit next, uh, Nathan, or be a docent at, or where's the next place if you could go anywhere? Where's the next Franklin Wright place you want to go visit? So if I could go anywhere, it'd have to be the, the, the Friedman House in New Mexico. I really think that it's a, a really unique take for a Frank Lloyd Wright building. Most people know Frank Lloyd Wright for modern architecture or for um, prairie style architecture. Um, but with that house, it really has a, a different feeling as it's almost rustic. It has some of the elements of Frank Lloyd Wright at Taliesin West. Uh, with the beautiful stone and uh, concrete masonry walls. It also has uh, very beautiful woodwork like you could see in a Gasonian house. Um, and I feel like uh, if I, I could become a, a docent at any of them, it'd have to be that one. You know, uh, Price, you, when we talked, you gave me a couple of places that you would love to, to if you couldn't docent at Price Tower anymore, wh where would you go? Where would you want to, uh, to go share the story and experience the architecture? Well, I have two favorite places. One of them is a private house right here in Bartlesville, which Timothy has seen, which is a Harold Price Jr. house called Hillside with a fabulous addition by William Wesley Peters. And fortunately, a few times I have been able to give a tour of that building with cat watching. 
and that's the owner of the house. And that's one of my favorite, it's a fabulous house. But the other one is the Martin House in Wichita. I found wait, it to wait be a such a- Wait, wait, I think, he, do you mean the Allen House? Because the Martin- did the I Allen. say the Martin House? Yeah, my brain Allen does the house. same thing, Price. That's why I wanted to make sure everyone heard the right thing. Now, yeah, you are, thank you, Tim. In the Allen House, which I find to be such a unique mixture of Art Deco, Usonian, modern, and prairie all in one. It was really his transitional house. And I love the gold leaf in the horizontal veins. Now, one thing that we brought up before, Tim, was the grid. I think the Price Tower is one of the few that has a parallelogram or a diamond as a grid. And one interesting thing, which you don't know, Timothy, I don't think, is when I was working with Gunny Harbo, the restoration architect, we measured every diamond in the building. And they measured 30, 30, 30, 29 and 7 eighths. Each one is an eighth of an inch off, which made us believe that it must have been a machine that cut it because there's over 50,000 of them. And a human could not make that same mistake every time. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. I love yeah, it. That's a little known fact for you to add to your vocabulary there, <laughs> Timothy. Michael, Michael, you, um, we talked before and you gave a couple of great examples. You're at this huge place, Talius and West. But yeah. I said, if you could be a docent anywhere else, you said the Seth Peterson Cottage? Yes. Which is, I, yes. Brock's face is exactly what mine was when you said that. Why Seth Peterson? Uh, I, I just, uh, we, we spent a couple of nights there and I would have to say that Wes Peters nailed it when he said, the Peterson Cottage has more architecture per square inch than any other right building. It's just, it's just a, a fantastic, fantastic space. The other one that I would really love to see, but it doesn't exist anymore, uh, and it's become kind of my recent obsession, is the Pawson House in Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, yeah. It was, uh, you know, had a fire, was never rebuilt. So. Oh, I'm with you. If you get to, if you figure out how to rebuild that one, you let me know. I'm, I'm yes, you got it. first night, right? <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, <coughs> Catherine, I don't know that I asked you that. No, I did ask you this question. You had a different reason for why you wanted to docent um, at the Westcott House in Springfield, Ohio. Why is that? Well, during this um, last 18 months of COVID, I've uh, been connected with the executive director there, Marta Wojcik, and she is so energetic and full of wonderful new ideas about how to use and, and highlight different aspects of, of Frank Lloyd Wright's house. I, I would like to uh, have her as my mentor. <laughs> no, I completely agree. That's totally good. Um, <laughs> Brock, I don't think that we ever, we, we didn't cover this quite. Brock and I have had a lot of conversations before. So I didn't grill you before this one, like I grilled everybody else. So Brock, I don't know what you're going to say. And you've already docented at a bunch of right places. So it almost sounds uh, greedy now for you to say anything else. But where's the next place on the list that you're applying for a, a job giving tours? Well, I, number one, I'd, I'd like to be here quite a while. I, I kind of like I like being here at LES. And I, I think it would be um, uh, maybe disingenuous to say, you know, I'm going to go with Franklin Rice answer the next one. Um, but uh, I, I definitely, you know, have a great love for the Dana Thomas house. Um, that's one mm -hmm. I have spent a good deal of time at. And um, I, I start, my first place was the Harley Bradley house. So the Prairie sensibilities are, are big in my heart and art class, especially um, for, for, for similar reasons, the Martin house is, is up there on the list. But um, I, I, I'm also in the school of I like some of the buildings that don't don't exist anymore. So I think it would be really cool to, you know, bring back the Larkin building and, and have that. So, but Florida Southern has, has me interested with all the campus architecture. I know mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm throwing it back to you, Tim, because Florida Southern, I, I love campus architecture and they've got some cool buildings down there. I will tell you, Brock, I've told you this before, but if I did not have so many other things going on in my world because I'm a parallel entrepreneur and I run a couple of companies. 
I would spend every summer at Taliesin, even with all the bad Wi-Fi and nobody else around there, and <laughs> and all the people asking me how to get to Franklin Wright's house on the rock. I would come to Taliesin <laughs> and be one of your guides because I have had some of the best tours ever there. I have had it, 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 and there is something about being at the laboratory of the master. You know what I mean? Same thing goes for Taliesin West. But but I will tell you, I mean. Uh, I literally, the very first book I had on Frank Lloyd Wright was when I was 13. It was the book by Vincent Scully Jr., his uh, essays about Frank Lloyd Wright. And there are quite a few Price Tower pictures in there. And at the time, I was a huge sci-fi fan, watched a lot of Star Trek The Next Generation. And it just felt like an alien world they had visited because Price Tower is so unusual. And I was so in love with that. And I told Price when I came to visit and he gave me a really lovely tour. If you ask him nicely and he has time, he gives you more than an hour and a half tour, by the way, because he's that kind of guy, he's that nice. And and I, it was just such a, those experiences for me, which is why I love doing this kind of a talk where we can talk to people who care so much. I mean, Catherine drives over an hour every day that she volunteers at Taliesin. And I don't know if you're with us, Catherine, because your video is in and out. And you, we know those are some of the concerns we have when we do digital stuff, but I don't know how to get the rest of you in a room anyway. So this is how we do it. Um, I The excitement level from people who have given talk, who are give tours and, and carry people, and you really are the front line. All of you are the front line for oh, so many new people. Um, uh, interestingly, Nathan, I, I want to end with something and I want to ask you and then we'll all have a moment to chat. Nathan, you represent for us, I hate to harp on your age, but you are the newest of us, right? You're, you've still got the bling, little shine on you. You're still brand new. Um, mm -hmm. Do you feel like that, that uh, there are people in younger generations understanding his work, getting to see it? You know, there are lots of visitors to all these places. The numbers are getting better at, at different places. Do you feel like there's a connection there for people who are in a younger generation to understand, appreciate, and can carry on the legacy of those of us who are sharing his architecture? Uh, definitely. I feel everyone uh, from very young uh, to very old can find something to appreciate in Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture. And I think, you know, really looking around at any Frank Lloyd Wright building, uh, there's, there's some way uh, that Frank Lloyd Wright saw a little differently with each house. Uh, each one has its really, really its own flavor. And um, I think there was a quote by um, another Frank Lloyd Wright house here in Iowa that was in a newspaper. And it, it went, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright house built in rural Iowa, a, a new way of building, a new way of seeing the world. And I really encourage everyone, um, uh, no, no matter what, you know, to get out in the world and to explore it a bit more. Um, and I do get a lot of people off of uh, Interstate 20 here in Iowa, not knowing what to expect when they come here. And when they walk into the garden room here, they're just completely taken aback, sometimes uh, yeah to tears, <laughs> especially after the piano too, but <laughs> it really, it touches something so deep inside everyone. I, I want to share a short video. This is, um, this is my friend who I just met this weekend. Uh, Dottie, if you see this, I hope you don't mind that I started with your tongue sticking out. Uh, this is Dottie Hensel, who is a docent, an interpreter at the Frank Lloyd Home and Studio. And she's just talking about the trip that she took with us. This is my one minute commercial, and then we'll do a closing thing. So Dottie, you've just finished going through a bucket list item for you, falling water. How have you enjoyed this trip with Architecture Travel Companion? I've loved it. As an interpreter at the Franklin Lloyd Home and Studio, I <clears throat> love the whole Frank Lloyd Wright concept. But to actually be here at Falling Water, oh my God. No, it had absolutely exceeded all expectations. And uh, Architecture Travel Companions has incredible attention to detail from all the things we did prior to falling water, um, Polymath Park and the Usonian houses, to the, the food, the lodging, impeccable attention to detail. The whole trip's been quite wonderful. Thank you for joining us, Dottie. Thank you. 
Okay, so I didn't pay her for that. She actually, <laughs> she was a paying guest. But uh, those are the it kind of things. Like. <laughs> and we hope to get to see all of you with other tour groups that we take. Before we go, um, Price, you told me one thing, and we're going to take a few more minutes past 8.30, but that's okay. If you want, you need to leave, not any of you, but if any of you watching need to leave, go right ahead. Um, Price, we talked, I don't know if you'll remember exactly what you said, um, but you told me there's three or four things you like to make sure that you get into every tour, be it to make every tour special. Do you remember some of the things that you really wanted to make sure people took away from a tour at Price Tower? No, but okay. that was good. I must have had a really inspired moment that It time. was really good. So you said that you wanted to emphasize how brave the Price Company yes, was. Yes, that's right. You've, you've reminded me now. I wanted to remind people how brave people were. Can you imagine a little town in Oklahoma having a famous architect come and do a building that was so outlandish, so unusual, how odd. And you know, one of my favorite quotes that Bruce Goff gave was he had accompanied Mr. Wright through the building on opening day. And so many people are saying, why did they build this building? It's crazy. What were they doing? And Mr. Wright's answer was, the building is too damn good for them. And do you know what? That's why I like people to remember the bravery of these people. And also the amount of money that was spent. Little oil company, little pipeline company, middle of Oklahoma in 1956, spending today what would be over $25 million to build this building. And Bartlesville is very unique in the fact that we welcome unique architecture. The community center, totally unique by William Wesley Peters, very daring. The town originally wanted to look like a colonial church was the original plan. And then this park having very avant-garde sculptures, a sculpture by Robert Indiana. Eloise Swayback Krista did a wonderful sculpture there. So they welcome really the unusual things to come in and just think of the bravery of these people to do that in that time period in the middle of very conservative Christian Oklahoma. I think that's fantastic and people get to see, I mean, it built a skyline for that city and you get to share that with so many people. Michael, what keeps you coming back and travel, you know, coming even though your, your knees have kept you from walking so much, but you're still there. I mean, you're helping in any way that you can. What keeps you doing that and helping to preserve the legacy of Frank Lloyd Wright? Well, it's, it's, it's really, a, I get a sense of uh, fulfillment from it. And, and, and I, I think this is something that uh, Nathan will share with people of his generation is that all of these years, all of the tours, now I'm working in collections, to me, it, it, it gives me personal pleasure to further the ideas of organic architecture, to tell the story of the man and the architecture and the principles. And, and uh, hopefully I've been somewhat successful in that over the years. I'm gonna end with, uh, with Catherine because she said something so fantastic in our talk that I think it will, when we talked yesterday, and gosh, Catherine, I hope, I hope this works because I hope you remember how wonderful it was. No, we were talking, <laughs> we were talking about something that I, that I know that all of us get, which is we get people on our tour who maybe are there because they've read Loving Frank or The Women, or they've read more of Wright's life, personal life story than the architecture. And I know every site deals with that differently. Mm -hmm. um, and we acknowledge, I acknowledge very much so because I am a storyteller. So much of what I talk to people about is Wright's life story. And I do get the architecture in there. So I kind of like trick them into learning architecture too, you know? But at the same time, I'm telling the story of a uniquely American man. I'm, I'm always amazed by how American his story is, pulling himself up by the boots, you know, becoming, fulfilling his destiny to become at least in, you know, many of our views, world's greatest architect. Um, Catherine, though, you said that that stuff doesn't exactly matter because there's a mindset that you want people to take with them, an attitude for how you want them to look when they go to any right space, as you describe them. Did you want to share a little bit about your philosophy there and what you would encourage people to do? Well, um, I really think that right sites um, are so inspirational. 
And uh, to me, it's important that people leave my tour um, with open minds and open hearts to go forward and experience other right sites because no matter how many you've been to and over many times as, as you've been to Falling Water, there's always something new to discover about this incredibly complex man and his and his very deep philosophy of architecture. And so if I can, if my uh, visitors go away knowing that his importance um, is, is the organic principles of architecture that he developed and so eloquently expressed in his work for so many years, then I will have done my job. Nice. Well, I think, uh, I think that's a really way, great way of saying it. And I think that it really does help to go learn about this master's work because every time I think I've gone to a place and seen every trick and thing he could have done to make me feel something, I then go to a place like Cedar Rock with Nathan playing the piano and walk into that garden room after this low compressed entry, you know, or I come to Taliesin West and, and can sit in an origami chair and enjoy the, I mean, look out at the amazing, uh, you know, the, the, the mountains and realize that the house, you know, is based on those. Or I can go up that tiny little elevator and then go into this amazing two-story almost uh, office for Mr. Price at Price Tower. I mean, we get that great emotional feel and we get to see things that we didn't expect him to do. And he just does it over and over and over again. And it's so fantastic that all of you get to share that with people. I really wanna thank my guests tonight. They are all at sites that are open to the public now. So please make sure you go support them and see them. Thank you, Price Connor from the Price Tower. Thank you, Price. Thank you. You are welcome. I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, Nathan from Cedar Rock there in Quasquitan, Iowa. Make sure you get out there and go see him. Thank you, Nathan. Thank, thank you so play. much for having me. <laughs> Michael Perino from uh, from Taliesin West, now the collections department, making sure yeah. all that stuff stays cataloged. So Michael, thank you so much for all your time and service. Tremendous pleasure. Thank you very much. Catherine, of course, coming to us from uh, the West Coast out there in Oregon in an amazing house that I will come see you really soon, Catherine. So I'm excited. Thank, thank you for you. joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And and the guy with all of the all of the name tags, we give it to to Brock, who's <laughs> got my favorite job at at Taliesin right now. Um, Brock, thank you for joining us again, being a guest another time, and sharing with these other great docents. Your your experience is really helpful, and and thank you for your help today. And we are we are so happy that we get to share this, and certainly we're excited to see you and your your group in October up here yes. at, in, in Wisconsin. So. Yeah, so if you'd like to go on a tour to Taliesin with us, we're going uh, architecturetravelcompanion.com. Uh, that's the last commercial I'll give you, but I will tell you this video will be edited in a couple of days and then we'll go on my YouTube channel and I'll make sure that all of the docents that were here today get a, a link to that. And I'll email it out to everybody who registered for the event because we had almost everybody show up, but um, for those, we'll be able to watch it later if they choose to. So please share it, please keep doing what you're doing and we'll see everyone later. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Wow, that was really good, right, Brock? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was fantastic. All right. Well, um, I nice. hate to hang up on all of you, but I thought we did a great job, and so you all should go enjoy. All right. Thank all right. you very Thank much. You, Bye, everybody. Thank you, Tim, for organizing. You're welcome. You all did nice great. Nice to meet you all. Have a lovely night, everybody.